or if this was tobacco and we were doing something. And what I started realizing was, God, none of these, isn't there some kind of general principles that guide how to look at this stuff? And so when I went to graduate school for a PhD, I realized that there were no required courses. I just had to take, I think I had to take um, a total of eight classes, organized classes. So I ended up taking seven in the math department, graduate level statistics. I only took one biology course the entire time. So I learned a lot about math and statistics and how to do this stuff myself. And it served me very, very well. Over the years, I've evolved a bit and I like to talk about analytics. Because in reality, see, here's what you don't learn in statistics. You don't really learn what to do with data, how to, how to design experiments, and you certainly don't learn how to publish data. You don't learn anything like that at all. And if you think about it, the entire data process if we think about it as a um, five or six course meal, right? You start with the appetizers and you end up with dessert. You go through this entire process all the time. Um, and so that's what I like to talk about. And years ago, I was actually teaching a course on this. But I don't think I've taught the course since 2018, and I probably never will. So what I've done today is I've basically boiled down an entire course into a one-hour lecture. How successful it will be, I don't know. But I want to give you a flavor for the sweep of things. And also, since I work primarily with environmental data, I always like to call it environmental analytics. Why won't this fast forward? There we go. So, one of the things I discovered, both as a student and as a professor, is most of you are particularly, if you're, like if you're a, in environmental science degrees, uh, you're required to take one or two courses. So uh, you know, in your sequence, for example, I'm sure a lot of you have taken 63.15 and 63.16 in the math department. And that, those, are, those are fine to get a taste of, of what this is about, but you're not, it's not nearly enough to learn the full suite of things. And obviously I'm never gonna, and there's just way too many topics to be covered, particularly in, in the context of a master's degree, which is only two years. But what I've discovered over my lifetime is that there's this logical sequence of events that always occurs when you're working with environmental data. Number one, you start with a question or a hypothesis. Number two, you design your work. And by design, I mean you figure out well, I'll define design in detail later. But basically figuring out what am I going to measure and how. And then there's you go through the process of actual acquisition, data acquisition. And maybe sometimes it's as simple as writing things down on a piece of paper. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes it's um, deploying an instrument that collects information Every six minutes, for example. Now, once you have this data, the next step is something called data management. And this is where I think 95% of graduate students fail. They don't realize that they've collected a treasure. And like all treasures, for example, your bank account, you've got to, you've got to manage it very carefully, or you will literally disappear. <laughs> and believe it or not, that's exactly what data is like. Anyway, now that you've managed the data, the next part is analysis. We have to figure out how to actually answer the questions or test hypotheses that we started out with. But you're not done yet. You've got to be able to convince people of what it is you've discovered 
or what question you've answered. And that requires visualization. So the bottom line is, you're really not done. Or the, what, what I'm trying to tell you is, there's this process and there's this logical sequence of steps that always, always happens. And that is going from a question to a final table or figure. And I'll tell you what else I've discovered over the years. If you really want to do this whole thing correctly from beginning to end, it's really helpful to have the end point clearly in mind. That's what I mean by think backwards. Start with what kind of picture, what kind of table do I want to have when I'm done? That'll convince people that I've actually answered a question, discovered something new, tested the hypothesis. Think about what the end point is going to be as you, as you start this process. If you do that, I think you'll be successful. So here's a little example of um, an endpoint. Uh, th this is a study I did. Um, oh, look at the dates, 2000. <laughs> so it's five years worth of data from 2000 to 2006. Actually, that's six years worth of data, isn't it? <laughs> and um, the purpose of this whole study was to try and understand how the opening and closing of the mouth of the Rio Grande was going to, um, uh, how the biological and ecological community is going to respond to it. And um, at the end of the day, this was one of the final um, images that I created for the publication. And you can see on the top there's salinity and then there's flow rates. And then, and then um, and a, a measure of animal diversity. And you, you can also see there's a lot of complexity in these graphs. There's all kinds of things going on. But the important thing is, all of this came from handwritten notes, right? So on the left side here, we have um, a hydrography field sheet which was the, um, the salinity data when we collected the samples. And then we had, um, the, then we had um, some biological, you know, species data and stuff like that. But the bottom line is a long time ago, I've been asking these questions about how much flow does a bay need to stay healthy? How much flow is needed to keep a river mouth open? questions like that. But the bottom line is, we always go from these handwritten notes, eventually there's some kind of analysis and a visualization to answer questions. That's the point I'm trying to make here. And if you think about it, we always follow these steps. We start with the question, we design the experiment, we acquire data. We manage the data, we analyze the data, and finally we create a visualization. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to go through and show you uh, how all these steps start. So the first one, as I said, is we always start with questions or hypotheses. And I think it's really important to start with theory. There needs to be, you need to think real hard about the assumptions you're making and how are you going to test them? And the next thing that you have to worry about all the time is the sort of logic you're going to be employing. Is it going to be deductive or inductive? And it really makes a big difference because at the end of the day, we want to be able to take our logic and boil it down to a mathematical equation, believe it or not. And if we can do that, then we're going to be able to successfully analyze the data. And then we want to start because the whole point is at the end is to create generalizations. And then we want to start developing some questions. The most difficult thing 
when you're starting out is to figure out how to ask a question in a way so that it does have an answer. Let me give you a good example. Uh, I actually wrote a whole paper about this a couple of years ago. When I first moved to Texas, way back in 1986, and I got my first job as an assistant professor, I was very lucky because I got involved in a research project uh, where one of the managers at the Texas Water Development Board came down. I was working at the University of Texas at the time. And he said, okay, I have a problem. I need to know how much fresh water has to flow in the San Antonio Bay to keep the bay healthy. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, that sounds simple. We can figure this out in two or three years. Well, it took me 20 years to figure out how to ask that question in a way that was actually answerable. <laughs> so that, believe it or not, is one of the big traps in science. It is when you pose your questions, it can't be of the variety of like how many fairies dance on the head of a pin. It has to be an answerable question. And you'll be surprised how hard it is to state your, you know, to look at your theories, your, your assumptions, and, and transform those into ways that are answerable questions. Now, there are a whole bunch of statistical jargon terms we need to get out of the way. Uh, and hopefully all of these words are something familiar to you. Again, I'm assuming you've all taken at least um, that first course called, you know, Math 6315, where you learn inter the introduction of statistics. But let's just go over a few words real quick so that we all have a common vocabulary. So what's a population? A population is a set of measurements. What's a sample? It's a subset of a population. Right, the population is all the possible measurements that exist. And what's a random sample? Well, very different point comes from the population as an equal probability of being selected. This is incredibly important and one of those things we overlook a lot of times. I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with students who are designing a project and they want to take a sample like every 100 meters. But what's wrong with that? Wait, they're all equally spaced. You know, that, that's not a random selection. Now, there are times when a design like that is the best way to do it, by the way, particularly if what you want to do is, is create a map at the end. But um, for the most part, I've been stunned how often I work with students and they don't actually have this concept of a random sample. Or random or or through replicate in their designs. And then another important concept is a distribution. There's something about populations, and that is um, there's going to be a distribution, the probability of, a, of something occurring. And the funny thing about this is just about every single kind of thing we can measure has got, when we look at a distribution, it's bell shaped. Now, it's not always a perfectly what we would call a, a normal curve. Sometimes it's pinched, meaning it's rather narrow. A lot of the, a lot of the measurements occur at, at a central point, but it, the tails are not very long. And sometimes it's the reverse. The flatter a curve gets, the more uniform the distribution is, meaning that all of the measurements have um, a, a, an equal probability of occurrence, but that's not true. What they really have is a, the probability of occurring only once when those bells get, or, or dome-shaped curves get flattened. It means that things are occurring very few times. There's not a central tendency. The other thing that's real common is a long tail on one side or the other. And typically, the long tails are on the left-hand side of a curve, meaning that we get lots of small values, and every once in a while, we get one huge value. That's, that's a real common uh, shape of a distribution for uh, organisms in the world. Parameter. This, drive, this word drives me nuts. I can't tell you how often 
students use the word parameter to mean something they've measured, and it's not. It's actually, for example, it'll talk about salinity and temperature are parameters of the environment. No, they're not. Those are variables. <laughs> a parameter is a number we use to summarize populations. For example, means and standard deviations or variances. That's what a parameter really is. It doesn't, the word parameter is not a synonym for variable. Please don't use the word parameter as a synonym of variable. Chemists are terrible at this. Every chemist I've ever met calls variables parameters. I don't know why they do that, but they clearly have never taken a statistics course in all this. In fact, I'll tell you another funny story from when I was an assistant professor. So this guy came down from the water board. He asked us to design a big study to look at how much fresh water inflow has to flow into a bed to keep it healthy. And I was going to work with a bunch of chemists. And so we started designing our experiment or, or field work. And I said, well, we'll have to take uh, multiple replicates and maybe even have replicate stations in different parts of the bay. And he said to me, replicates? What do you need replicates for? Just measure it right the first time. I'll never forget that. that. That was an honest statement from someone. All right, next, next thing to define is statistic. Uh, again, these are numbers that summarize uh, data in a sample. And sometimes there are subsets, you know, for example, uh, the, um, the sample mean. Now notice that I've talked about the population mean which is different from the sample mean. This is an incredibly important concept. What we're saying is there's some real mean out there, which is for the entire population. All the measurements that could be made in the world, we're going to call that mu. And then there are the sample means you get. Because when you take samples, and that's we're going to call that y bar. And notice that this and this are not the same thing. <laughs> the bottom line is, if you run an experiment more than once, you're going to get different sample means. If you run measurements or sampling more than once, every time you're going to get a different sample mean. None of them are wrong, but there are possible outcomes based on the number of samples and a bunch of things. The idea is that. The more samples you take, the closer we get to this. But that's the whole concept here. That's, that's an important concept to realize. So, you know, the, the joke in statistics is, um, you know, people in Hollywood can't be too rich and they can't be too thin. Well, in statistics, you can't have too many samples or too many data or too much data. But that's the analogous um, joke. So, again, a whole course can be, so when statisticians use the word experimental design, if you take a class called experimental design, what they're going to do is they're only going to talk about the relationship amongst uh, y's and x. So if you look at this first little equation right here, y equals x plus some random error, okay? That's what we call a general linear model. That's basically a model, a mathematical representation for every experiment that has ever been run on the face of the earth. It's really just that simple. And what we're saying is, we have things we measure that change as a function of things we control, plus some random error. Statisticians don't use the word measured and controlled. They like to use the word dependent variables and independent variables. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter which taxonomy you use here. The bottom line is on the left side of equations, or the dependent measurements, these are the things that
that are changing as a function of our experiment. And on the right hand side experiment, we have our independent variables or the things we control. When I say control, I mean, they're the things we set up as our experimental uh, units. And of course, there's always error. Because the error exists, that's why we always have replicates. That's why we must take replicates. By the way, that's the answer to the chemist. The trick is, we can have one thing on the left or right hand side of that equation, or we can have a lot of things. So for example, here, here's an example of a univariate model where there are several X's. Um, for example, this might be dates, this might be stations, interactions, there might be other uh, issues, phases, uh, areas, units. There could be tons of different things over there. Or it could be the reverse. We can go to one place, one time, right? one place at one time and measure lots of different things. <laughs> Salinity, temperature, nutrients, chlorophyll. All of those are on the left-hand side of the equation. So the punchline is that data can be univariate or multivariate, or it can be both. And in fact, this is what, particularly for the kind of work we all do, environmental work, this is the way, this is what really happens all the time. We deal with the most complex kind of data on Earth because it's multivariate. It's always multivariate. I mean, who goes out and measures one thing? I've never seen that in my entire career, at least not in our field. And I say our field because I'm assuming you all do something related to the environment, okay? And the other thing is, we always have complicated designs. In fact, uh, I won't go into that story now. So the bottom line is we have complexity on both sides of the equation. So, by the way, before I leave this slide, if you take a course, I can't remember the name of the course now, might be 63, 16. Um, when statisticians say this is a corresponding experimental design, they actually mean only one thing. They actually mean we're going to do this. They never cover this or this in those courses. And they only cover the relationship amongst the independent variables. As you might imagine, there are infinite varieties of ways to design experiments. But typically when people, statisticians say the word experimental design, all they're really talking about is how to do the various flavors of analysis of variance or analysis of covariance uh, or multiple regression or something like that. But they, if they tell you this is a course in multivariate statistics, they usually only do this. <laughs> but as I said, the reality is our data always looks like that. And so this is one of the reasons why I started a lecture saying you can never take too many statistics course. And it's and I didn't discover this, what I just told you, until I was in my fourth or fifth math course. <laughs> I didn't realize. No wonder every time I went to a statistician for advice, they didn't know what I was talking about because the, they didn't know all of this stuff either. <laughs> and they kept trying to fit me into this hole or this hole. And I was in this body. Yeah. What would you do if your dependent variables also affected each other? If I went what? Like if your dependent variables also affected each other. So your independent variable would affect the dependent, but they're also messing with each other. Well, so those are called feedbacks. Sometimes there are feedbacks and you have to figure out ways to measure those feedbacks, quantify them, or test them for having no effect at all. So that could be an assumption, for example, that you would might want to set up as a test in your experiment. 
Okay. So if you really want to get into all the gore, all the gory details of this stuff, you got to take probably three or four stat courses. You can't take less than three. <laughs> You got to go all the way through. I think it's so you got to take 63, 15, 16, and I think there's something like a 17 or an 18. I can't remember now. But as I so, one of the things you learn in those courses is how to build those mathematical models. And one of the things I discovered a long time ago is that um, there's really two steps. The first step is you've got to be able to draw the design. You've got to be able to explicitly relate the relationships amongst the independent variables. You've got to be able to do that. There are two different ways of doing that. I'm going to show you examples of both. And then once you have that picture in front of you, it's actually very easy to build a mathematical model to describe that picture. So let me give you an example of a classical two-way analysis of variance or a two-way cross design. So the first thing we might do is build a tree diagram. So we've got two levels, or uh, we have two treatments here, what I'm gonna call them A and B. In my work, this is always uh, location and time. <laughs> I always sample at different places and I sample multiple times. So A and B, and notice that at every single, um, let's make A time, at every time, time one, two, and three, we sample station one and station two every single time. Because we sample one and two at every level of A, we call this a cross design. There's another way to represent this. And that's in a block diagram. So on the top row, you see we have the three kinds of A's, and on the bottom, the three kinds, the two kinds of B. And you'll notice that we have every single block filled. And these are why these are usually called complete block designs, by the way, because everything is filled up. So how do we build a model? Well, the statistical model is going to look something like this. Right, where the things we measure, they always function as a function of, they always change as a function of the overall sample mean and error, but we have a, we have a term for A, a term for B, and a term for the interaction. What is this? This is, are there changes going across that are not parallel? And of course, you know, if you've taken uh, stat one and stat two, you've learned that when this is significant, you have to look at simple main effects and treat these as six independent treatments in a one-way analysis of variance. So those are the typical kinds of ways we do it. Uh, we usually employ it in some kind of software and the software models that we use usually look something like that. Let me show you one more example. And this is going to be a method design. So let's look at this one. Oops. In this case, we have one, two, and three again. So imagine we went out and sampled three times. But notice here that when we go out the second time, we go to a completely different place. We're going to call that three. And notice that every time we sample, we sample someplace completely different. Well, how do we represent that in the block? Well, it looks like this, doesn't it? So in A, B1 and 2 got sampled only once, then 3 and 4 got sampled only once, then 5 and 6 got sampled only once. Guess what we call this? If the other one was complete block, what would you call this? Incomplete block. That's right. The other thing we call it is nested. We also call it hierarchical. Now, not all incomplete block designs are necessarily nested or hierarchical. 
but all hierarchical and mess designs are incomplete blocks. So how are we going to model this? Well, the first thing you should notice is those interactions have disappeared, right? There's nothing here. A lot of the interactions don't exist. None of the interactions exist, in fact. There's nothing that's, well, there's kind of something going across there and from here to here, but for the most part, there are literally no interactions in any of this design either. And so when we build a statistical model, there's no interaction term. We have just A and B, but notice that all of the stations related, all the levels related to B are within just this B block, the, top, the station block, and there's no interaction at all. So that's a formal way to state mathematically exactly what that picture looks like, okay? And then, you know, typical software models, regardless of what kind of software you use, will look something like this. And they typically use a parentheses or something like that to represent nested or hierarchy. But here's the key thing. The Bs are unique to A. And then there's a lot of problems about how you collect the F tests and things like that. Again, you know, normally I would spend a whole hour going over things like this, and I, I don't have time to show you any more examples. But what I wanted to do today is show you the most important part of this, which is how to build pictures of your experiment, how to build pictures of your sampling design, how to build pictures of uh, the relationships amongst the variables that you're controlling. That's the important lesson here. And one of the things I asked you to do today is you want to build pictures. Hopefully you brought some data with you. We can look at it when we're done. And we'll build pictures of your data sets and that'll tell you exactly how to analyze it. So you've analyzed, you've got your question, got your hypotheses, you've got your sampling or your experimental design. You know where you're going to put your cages or your fish tanks or your whatevers. Let's go out and collect data, right? Now, there's one more important set of terms you really got to understand, and that's the difference between accuracy and precision. So I show you two dartboards here. And you'll notice in the one on the left here, All of these darts, are, well, I wish this one had been over there. They're pretty far apart, but the average is right about there. So if we're trying to measure this, these are telling us pretty accurately where the center, center is. But look at these three darts. They're all close together, but they're all off. So this is estimating a mean over here when the true mean is there. So it turns out, even though these are more precise, being the measurements are grouped closely together, they actually are not accurate. <laughs> There's a bias in here. You know, maybe there was a crosswind this day that kept blowing the darts to the left or something. Or maybe someone was just right-handed and they keep crossing their arm and everything kind of drifts to the left when they throw it. Whereas here, even though the measurements are all far apart from one another, they actually more accurately represent the center. At least that's what I'm trying to show you. So it's really important that you always understand your, whether your measurements have accuracy or precision or both. If you do real environmental work, that requires things like quality assurance uh, plans or quality assurance project plans or quality control quality assurance plans. You're gonna have to address these things very, very, um, in very detailed ways. And it's a really big issue, particularly with when you're using machines to measure things. 
for example, you're measuring um, chemical concentrations or something like that, understanding the accuracy versus precision of your measurements is a critical uh, theory, uh, a critical aspect. There's something else which I'll give you a preview to when we get to data management, right? When you figure these things out, you damn well better write it down somewhere. You're gonna have to be able to prove things like how accurate and how precise your measurements are. The real critical thing here is always going to be understanding the difference between something we call machine error and sample error, right? You can take the same exact sample, run it through a machine several times and maybe get slightly different numbers. That's a precision issue. That's not an accuracy issue. You're only going to get accuracy by taking multiple replicates in the environment, right? But those are the kind of things that have to be in your metadata at some point or another. And I'll get to that word in a minute as well. Ethics. Actually, about 10 slides on this, I decided to delete them all. I'm not going to give you a big lecture on ethics right now, but guys, do not make stuff up. Do not falsify. Just, just don't do it. The, the, um, the temptation when you're running behind schedule, when you're frustrated because you didn't get the answers you were hoping to find is incredibly powerful. And I've seen people cheat in my career. I've seen people make data up in my career. And it's always a bit surprising and shocking. But, you know, probably the one point in this process where you, you have a tendency, where you have a temptation, let's call it, to do something wrong usually comes in this phase of it all, is in the acquisition phase. But again, this is one reason why very strong quality assurance, quality control, what we call QAQC procedures, this is why they exist. So that you can prove that your data is, is, is accurate and reliable. And when I say accurate here, I mean is what's written on a page or what's in a computer screen uh, is what actually was, was measured. Uh, that's why these things exist. Now, turns out there's lots of kinds of data. And you know what I realized? I forgot to put images here. <laughs> I just realized I forgot one. But mostly we talk about continuous versus discrete or categorical or um, discontinuous variables. So that when the responses are um, continuous numbers, this is numeric data. Sometimes the responses are A, B, C, or D, or sometimes they're just zero and one. And those are what we call discrete or discontinuous variables. We also have controlled variables. For example, the things on the uh, X side of the equation, right? Those are all variables, but they're not our measurement variables or control variables. When those things are continuous, we have a regression problem. When those things are discrete, we have an analysis of variance problem. So all data, when we collect it, is gonna have two attributes. We call it numeric or alphanumeric. And again, the word categorical is a um, synonym for the word alphanumeric. An important point here is when we get to the next phase, which is data management. You can't mix these in the same columns. If you have these in the same columns in your spreadsheets, you're never going to be able to analyze the data. <laughs> Sometimes we have to have qualifiers. A good example of getting back to machine uh, measurements. Maybe the machine has got a detection limit. You can measure between 0.1 and 100 micrograms 
of chlorophyll in a spectra in, a, in, in most um, spectrophotometers. But if the concentration is less than a microgram, we don't know what it is. Well, we know it's somewhere between zero and one, but we have no idea where the number is. So rather than representing that as less than one, you should always have two columns in your data set, one for the variable, uh, one for the value, and then another one for what we call a flag or the note. Oh, even though I wrote one here, it, well, we really know it's less than one, but we don't know it's somewhere between zero and one. That, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. But you're not going to be able to analyze data if you have a mixture of numbers and letters in that column. Now, I know that may sound obvious, but you'd be stunned how often I see it. Now, here's another important detail. As you're collecting data, you must keep track of and distinguish between data and metadata. So data is the values, the observations. Metadata is the data about the data. All of these things must be written down and must be kept inside your spreadsheets, believe it or not. You must understand you got to write a note on the methods, but most important thing is units. I can't tell you how often I'm working with a student. And I say, well, what's a unit here? And they go, oh, gosh, I don't remember. <laughs> Locations. How often have I worked with a student? I said, well, what's the latitude and longitude? And they go, oh, I don't know. We never measured it when we were out there. We got to keep these things. And then sometimes we have derived variables. There are measurements from calculations. They're not something you observe directly. You, you got to write down the formulas. Um, sometimes this requires uh, permissions. By permissions, I mean you're using uh, something that's copyrighted to collect your information. Do you have permission to use that 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 tool? You may need that before you can publish or use it in your thesis or dissertation. Finally, something that's relatively new. Um, this is the first time I put this word in a presentation about data. And that is we now are required to give declarations for everything. A good example is if you um, were doing a survey and you had to get the survey approved by the um, What's the name of that office? Compliance office or something? You know, but the bottom line is today, you can't just go out and collect data. Typically, there are some rules, some compliance issues, um, particularly if you have any human subjects or any endangered species, for example, in your study. You're going to have to declare or prove that you've complied with rules, regulations, and laws in terms of how that data was collected. So you've got to have all those declarations. That's all part of your metadata. You're going to have to supply that or show that to someone at some point in your life. And the bottom line is, when you're collecting data, the bottom line is, write it down. Trust me, you're not going to remember later. <laughs> write it down when you're doing it and make sure it's in your Excel spreadsheet in a second file, in a second sheet called metadata. So when I collect data and I start typing it into Excel, I'll have one sheet, I'll literally call that sheet data, and I put all my numbers in it, or the values, and I always have a, a sheet I call metadata. And I put all this other crap in it. But you only have to write it down once, right? If you're measuring chlorophyll and it's in micrograms per liter, you don't have to write micrograms per liter on every damn row in your value sheet. You just write it once in your metadata sheet. Those are the shortcuts I take. If I'm sampling at four locations, I'm going to write the latitude and longitude down once, but I don't need to write it on every single row in my value sheet. That's why it's so important to always have a separate metadata sheet in your files. 
write down all those details because trust me, you won't remember later. <laughs> I know this is true. I don't remember things I've done. All right. So we design our, we ask our question. We designed our experiment. We acquired all the data. Now we have a problem of what do we do with it? How do we, how do we manage it? <laughs> and again, if you don't manage data, it will disappear. I can guarantee you that one thing. If you don't manage your data, it will disappear. There's something else really important today, which again was not true even a few years ago. And that is nearly every journal, well, every journal I work with or I would publish in today usually requires or requests that you have a statement, a declaration on data availability. People expect data to be posited in repositories today. You're not going to be able to deposit data if you actually don't have it all written down. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we're back to an ethics issue and we're back to an issue of accuracy and QAQC. If you don't have effective data management practices, you'll never be able to guarantee your data is accurate and aligned with your research objectives and can be used to drive decisions. And again, I'm, I'm taking the liberty here, assuming that um, you know, you, many of you have an interest in environmental science. The interesting thing about environmental science is the price of poker for us is higher than people who are just doing basic or pure research. You know why? Because decisions aren't made based on their data. When you collect environmental data, decisions might be made based on your data. We're back to the importance of QAQC and being able to prove that the numbers in your spreadsheets are real and accurate. Because someone might actually take those numbers and try and make a decision on it. And even simple things like salinity measurements. You know, you're probably all aware that um, the city of Corpus Christi is proposing a desalination plant be put somewhere in the base system here. We you know one of the most fundamental things that is going into the research and planning on those things is what's the base salinity? Because they want to know how much it might increase or if it would stay the same uh, if, we, if we concentrate the salt and have a brine discharge. And I can't tell you how much salinity data I've been looking at over the last couple of years and how much of it I know is inaccurate <laughs> because I know these data sets. So, you know, it's really, really important. Uh, in fact, this, this sentence here, I probably took this right out of one of my QAPPs, quality assurance uh, plan. Effective data management guarantees that it's accurate and aligned with research objectives. I wish I had a comma after that and used to drive better decisions. But the important thing is aligned with research objectives. That's a really important concept here. Why? Because this is a sequence of events. You see, you see the importance of the sequence here? <laughs> That's exactly why. So, I wish I hadn't done this. I wish I had done a little bit of a. Don't look at these bottom things. Don't look at these tables yet. <laughs> and don't look at this. <laughs> All right. So, what I want to do now is talk to you a little bit about database structures. Um, so, you've collected all your data. Maybe it's on handwritten sheets. Maybe it's in files from an instrument, right? Now you want to type it into your database. You want to create your database. How do you do that? 
Well, it turns out there are two basic database structures. Computer scientists always call these data models. I don't know why they call them data models. I hate using the word model for a structure, but I've never met a computer scientist who didn't call database structure uh, by the synonym data model. So don't get confused when you see that word. That's one of the big problems of the word model. It probably has got about 10 different meanings in science, but that's another story. But at the end of the day, there are two basic ways to create data sets. Either as a flat file or what we call a relational file. Here's the key difference. In a flat file, they're always simple, but they're really hard to keep the metadata associated with the values. And here's where most students get in trouble. They've got a sheet with a bunch of values. Six months later, they go back and they start scratching their head and they say, hmm, where the hell did that number come from? <laughs> because, you, because in a flat file, unless you repeat, for example, the Latin launch, the units on every single row, unless you repeat key information on every single row, you're never quite sure if they all relate to one another or how they relate to one another. And in fact, that's why we use the word relationship. So, the, so for example, this is an example of a, of a flat file. So on one day, I went to three places. Here's my value, right? These are my, this is Y, these two are X, right? These are our independent variables. This is our dependent variable. These are the things we control. These are the things we measure. So there's another key thing here. We always put the X stuff on the left side of the data set on the, on the spreadsheet. So that's the classic flat file. The problem is we don't really know anything about where is A, where is B. We don't know what the units are for the column on the far right, do we? So one way to do one way to solve the problem is with what we call a relational database. And in a relational database, um, we have a key variable which occurs everywhere, and you have different tables which can either be joined or merged to create the information you want. So in this case. I actually put every single variable here in a different um, station. See, this is an error. This should say A, B, and C. This is an error. Well, because I have only three rows here, it doesn't matter. But the point is, we can always, we only have the point. I'm going to go ahead and fix it. So now we only have to write this down once, right? And we can always merge this by that key field. Or if we write everything down only once, I could have left that as samples. We could always merge these in any way we want to get the combination of metadata that we need. But the bottom line is here is there's always this key variable, like a sample identification number or something. And you know that the data goes together, match merging, or computer scientists would say they join the tables, and they always call these tables um, by the key code. So those are the punchline is these are the two basic structures. And the easiest way to do things I always find is basically a combination of the two. Um, I do things like this all the time where I put the different 
information in a separate sheet because that's metadata. And I'll put methods and other things and units in a different sheet. But basically, there are those two basic um, data structures, either a flat file or relational. There's nothing else absolutely critical. Never make it look fancy. No extra spaces. It doesn't matter if you change fonts and, you know, make it look pretty. But don't have any blank spaces anywhere in your data sets. Never have blank spaces. Never have, never skip rows. Uh, never do things like that because it'll always screw up your analysis. Now, uh, there's another important thing about how do we define well-managed data? So well-managed data is in the right place, meaning you can move it efficiently between multiple systems. That's actually one of the beauties of a flat file. It's really easy to take a text flat file and use it on any kind of computer or software system in the world. Uh, it's at the right time, meaning that uh, for example, if you have sensors or streaming data from an instrument, it's in the right format, and it's available for all users. Now, there's another important computer science word, semantics. What does semantics mean? When computer scientists say semantics, they're talking about Do two things mean one thing or two different things? Let me give you an example. Uh, years ago, I did this enormous project on hypoxia in Corpus Christi Bay. We had computer scientists from the University of Illinois, from UT Austin, and from University of Utah. We had chemists from four or five different universities and we have some biologists from two or three different universities. The first thing we discovered was everyone had a different variable name for dissolved oxygen. <laughs> some called it, they had the whole word dissolved oxygen. Some people called it DO. Some people call it DO conch, as in CONC for DO concentration, as opposed to DO saturation. And some didn't tell you whether they were giving you the value in milligrams per liter, in millimoles per, per liter, in, uh, in saturation, which is percent. We, when we pulled together eight or nine different data sets on dissolved oxygen concentration in water, we realized, number one, everyone had a different variable name, and everyone's units were different. <laughs> and without the proper metadata, we couldn't convert the stuff so it all meant the same thing. That's a good, and so one of the computer scientists said, oh, we, we need is a semantic mediator. <laughs> so semantics in computer science means, one word means one thing to everybody. <laughs> so you can think of it as a translator. It's very, very, we're back to the importance of metadata. If we didn't have our metadata, we wouldn't realize some of these variable names are exactly this, they meant the same thing. And some, that, but some meant the same thing, but they were in different units. So, uh, semantic mediation is incredibly important. We're back to why it's so important to have good metadata so that someone can look at your data and they'll understand exactly what was measured, how it was measured, and what the units are, what it means. So, I have, believe it or not, 37 published data sets with DOIs. Uh, most of them are on grid C, which is um, something that's actually operated out of this building. But I started this technique well after Excel was invented, but a long time ago. 
And this is a good example of how I create every single one of my data sets. So you'll notice that on my first page, I always have a tab called metadata. It's always the first page of every Excel spreadsheet I create. And you'll notice at the top, I have a title. And then I have my name and address. And then I have the date in which the sheet was created or edited or updated. Now, really fancy computer scientists will version. We'll have a list of every single date the thing was changed and how it was changed. That's way too far for even me. Believe it or not, when I started out in the 80s, that's what I was doing. But in those days, we were on mainframes and we didn't have Excel. Life was so complicated before PCs, you don't even want to know about it. But anyway, versioning was a really big deal back in the day. I don't worry about versioning anymore. I'm, I'm kind of like the German clockmaker, you know that joke? If you have two clocks, you never know what time it is. <laughs> I want one clock, give me one file. I don't know why, I don't want a bunch of versions. But anyway, the next thing is, is I'll have a purpose line. Why was this sheet created? Why was this sheet created? And here, a lot of times, I'll have the experimental questions, hypotheses, things like that. I have a reference. And I created this when it was submitted. That's actually been published. I need to update that. So that date's incorrect, I think. Eh, maybe it is correct. No, it's incorrect. That was published. Actually, I don't remember when it was published. But anyway. Um, and then I have... Um, I always use the same exact kind of format. I have my sheet name, sheet description, then units in this column, the variable names in the sheet, the variable descriptions and that. So if we go to the sheet called data counts, here are all the columns, here are all the definitions of the columns, and here are the units. And notice I always write down my date format. Dates, dates, there are thousands of date formats. Don't assume everyone else is using the American standard of month, day, year. Very few people do. I almost never do. I love what we call database format. I didn't do it here with year, month, day, because everything always sort correctly. And then notice that rather than a whole separate sheet for locations, I just put it in a separate um, little mini table over here on the metadata sheet. Kind of cheating. Let me see what the next one looks like. Oh, good. So if we look at data count, here's what the data count sheet looks like. As you might imagine, all the other sheets look something like this. And if we go further down here, we would find that sheet with all the variables and all the definitions. So when you organize things like this, it's easy to say other people will be able to understand it. The reality is you'll be able to understand it six months from now or a year from now. <laughs> but you, know, you can see the date. I'm lazy. I just write STA rather than the word station. I write rep. And so here, notice I put one, comma, two, comma, three, comma. What that means, these are the potential values. No other values exist. And that's another common thing I do. And, you know, the, um, the section depth, which is in centimeters, that's how deep in the sediment sample came from. And then I have these little codes for species and then species names and finally count. And then finally a number, that should be to n, number per meter square, not grams per meter square. And so that's what you see on the sheet, okay? And data like this is easy to use. It makes it easy for analysis. Now, 
why am I so, what's the right word, strict about this? Or why am I so encouraging about this? Two big reasons. Number one, I already mentioned, today nearly all journals are encouraging, if not requiring, that they be publicly archived. Plus, there's something else important. You know, the work we do has incredible value, but if it's not available to future generations, it's like it didn't exist. If it didn't exist, it's like you didn't exist. Just think, these data sets will be there long after I'm dead and gone. It literally gives me a, a little piece of immortality. Plus, if someone wants to know 100 years from now, so has Corpus Christi Bay really changed as a result of climate change? They can go back and look at my data. Go try and look at someone's data from the 1900s or 1910s or 20s or 30s. Hell, from before the year 2000 almost. It's almost impossible to find data before the 70s. Why? Because we just didn't do it. It drives me nuts every time a professor retires and they go in and they take all his office and lab and all that paper and just put in a dumpster. Millions of dollars worth of incredibly valuable information that will never exist again. It's all gone. It's insane. We can't let that happen, people. If you do nothing else with your master's thesis and never publish it, at least take your data set, upload it to a repository. But for data to be used, it has to be fair. Fair means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And if you want to know what that means exactly, you can go to this website. But the bottom line is that little spreadsheet I just showed you is a good example of stuff that's easy to find. It's accessible. I'm making an assumption. 50 years from now, 100 years from now, someone's going to be able to open up an XLS file. That is an assumption on my part. Whether it's a good assumption or not, that's a whole other interesting question. About two and a half, two years ago, maybe it was three years ago, I spent my entire Christmas vacation moving files from Lotus 1, 2, 3 to Excel because I no longer had any programs that could open up a Lotus 1, 2, 3 file. Lotus 1, 2, 3 was the first spreadsheet program invented in 83, 4, or 5 something like that. And I used it probably until about 88, maybe 90-ish, when Excel, Excel wasn't really invented until 91, 92-ish. But now nothing will read that old format. So this is why we got to be careful about formatting. Um, if I was really, really not lazy, I'm a little lazy myself, I would be putting everything in just plain old text files. But that's way too much like work. That's, believe it or not, that's harder because you've got to be very careful about commas and how you set it all up. It's, it's more complicated. So I'm just kind of trusting that there will always be an Excel reader out there in the future. I have to admit, I'm, I'm making that blind trust in my life. So that's what we mean by interoperable. Any machine can read it. And of course, reusable. And I hope the way that I showed you, I create my data sets, that anyone could look at that and say, yeah, I know exactly where the data came from. I know exactly how it was collected and exactly how it was used. <laughs> and I can use parts of it or all of it if I wanted to. So I'm a big fan of that approach. Here are a whole bunch of data depositories. I've got data at data one. That's the first place I started putting at. I think I have something in Dryad. Um, I know I have a lot of stuff in Grid C. That's the HRI data set. I have stuff in OBIS because I was required to do that with NSF grants. And I have some stuff in NCEI, which is the NOAA one. This is where all my Deepwater Horizon data is. I have a second set of nearly all my Deepwater Horizon data in a completely different format in grid C. 
And that's another important detail. There's nothing wrong with having your data in multiple places. <laughs> it promotes that interoperable issue. For example, for me to put my stuff in NCEI, I had to, I had to put it in their data model. Noah gave me the data model and said, your data must look like this. I can guarantee you most people would be would look at that stuff and go, what do I do with this? <laughs> to me, it's not very interoperable. It's not very accessible. Also, I've gone to NCEI and I've searched for my data there and I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I decided, shit, I'm putting everything on grid C as well, because it's really easy to find it there. And it's in simple spreadsheets that everyone is familiar with. All right. We've got our data in our spreadsheets. We're finally ready to start running our favorite software package. Most of you are probably using R or something like that. I think the most important thing to always start with is what I call exploratory analysis. What does your data look like? You need to just look at, just look at it. But I think one of the most important ways to look at data is with box plots. These are my favorite tools. Every software package on earth will create a box plot and they all use the same exact scheme. The important thing is the box is between the first and third quartile. It's where some people use boxes with one standard deviation, which would be 68% rather than 75. Uh, there's always going to be you know, the mean, and the median, the median will be a bar, the mean will be an X or star or something like that across. And then there'll be fences, which are usually uh, the interquartile ranges as well. And then the outliers will be specific dots out there. Um, you just look at this by treatment or overall, and you learn so much just by staring at box plots. It's my favorite, favorite tool. Some people like to build the little bell-shaped curves, and that's fine. I find I never... I don't do that too often because this, this is all I really need to do. Just look at the means and medians and ranges of things. Build a table. First thing you should always do is just look at your data and ask yourself, what's it telling me? What does it taste like? What does it smell like? You know, that's how I like to look at data. And then of course you're gonna do all your ANOVA stuff. You're gonna compare means. Most of you are going to use general linear model stuff. Today, a lot of, or generalized linear model, which simply means the transformation functions are built in. It's nothing different at all, in spite of what people tell you. Uh, but the most important thing is understanding the assumptions. And that is, you can't build linear models without the assumption of linearity. Remember the very first slide with all those equations? All the treatments had a plus sign in between them. That is not trivial. <laughs> but you can be non-linear means there's a plus sign between your terms. Non-linear means it's a multiplication sign or division sign. Plus and minus are the same, by the way. Um, but here's the most important thing. And that is, we're assuming that the residuals are normal. What are residuals? It's the part left over after you've explained uh, the location of your measurement based on your treatments. And most people think data has to be normal. That's false. It's the residuals or the error terms that have to be normal. So you have to run your stuff through an, an ANOVA, collect the residuals and only look at the, if you're gonna build charts of distributions, only look at residuals. That's why on the previous 
slide, I say, I never look at bell curves or the shapes of distributions on raw data. I never look at that. It's meaningless. It's only the residuals that matter. The most important thing is actually this one, independence of error. What does that mean? It means you took random samples. <laughs> We're back to, should I take my sample? If I wanted to know the abundance of people in this room, should I take a sample every 10 meters or randomly place my samples? That, that's, that's the really important thing there. And again, normally people spend one or two semesters on all this stuff. I'm not gonna try and teach you statistics here today. This is somewhat important, uh, but it bores me. Aerotypes, you know, what's alpha, what's beta. To me, the most important thing here, really, believe it or not, is um, one of these, beta, the power to determine if you can actually detect change, which is alpha. People don't think about it, and they don't always calculate beta, but it's probably the most important thing. It's the power to detect change with your design, with your mathematical formulation of the data. Um, and, you know, we, we just realize that when it comes to hypothesis testing, this is what you're really doing. It's this issue of error types. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of this in a lot of detail, except to say this. Um, people, I can't tell you how many times someone has said to me, um, I can't do analysis of variance because my data is not normal. Well, what's wrong with it? There's so much wrong with a statement. Like, and I've heard that statement literally thousands of times in my career. I heard it just last week, in fact. That statement's completely incorrect <laughs> for lots of reasons. The first and foremost reason is data is not supposed to be normal. The residuals are. Did you look at the distribution of data or the distribution of residuals? When you look at the distribution of residuals, they're almost always normal. People don't look at the right things. The next thing is, how normal does normal really have to be anyway? Well, most statistics packages have five or six ways to test whether a distribution of even the residuals is normal or not. Uh, one of my, and, and then of course, people have created all of these non-parametric approaches for when data is not normal. My favorite quote was from a statistics professor of mine who learned, his major professor was Fran Wilcoxon who created all the Wilcoxon sign texts. And she always used to say, testing data for normality using most of those goodness of fit tests to see if the data is robust enough for ANOVA is like testing the ocean with a rowboat to see if it's robust enough for the Queen Mary. The point is, there have been, and, and I learned this when I took a course in non-parametric statistics. What we did is we calculated the power to detect change with the um, non-parametric approach versus the parametric approach for just about everything. T-tests, one, one way you know is two way you know, know is blah, blah, blah. And the answer is, even if your data is uniform, meaning every single value occurs only once, it's a flat line. It's even worse than there's no bell at all, the flat line. You still get the right answer 9,999 times out of 10,000. So the bottom line is ANOVA GLM parametric statistics is so robust, it's almost impossible to make a mistake. So don't worry about things like that. That's not what you should worry about. Worry about the things that really matter and the only thing that really matters is this whole part. Does your model actually fit the data, fit the experiment? 
do you have all the do you have all the treatment levels in one model? Or did you sample randomly? Is there actually independence over there? These are the, the B ones are the only ones that matter that make your assumptions invalid. None of the A ones. The A ones are all about the normal distribution bullshit. It's just not something to worry about. These are the ones that really matter. And the most important one is this one, that the model actually fix the data. And you know how you know you're doing it wrong? When you have to run several models to look at one different one data set. If you're doing that, you know you're doing it wrong. And I see people do that all the time. They can't figure out how to build one model to describe their entire experiment. So they'll build four. Well, I'm going to analyze each station separately over time. They do things like that. Or I'm going to analyze just this mesocosm and this mesocosm separately because something different's going on in them. No, that's what this. That's what your model development is for. Not to create a bunch of, or I'm gonna do a bunch of t-tests because I can't tell which, which, which means and what of the different levels are different within treatments. No, that's exactly what people do wrong. So this is up here to tell you the punchline, which is of all the assumptions that can blow up your analysis, only one matters, and that's this one. Your model's correct. That's the only one that matters, which is why that whole exercise of mapping and blocking and building tree diagrams of experiments is so important. So bell-shaped curves, I don't care about this. I'm getting bored, so I want to stop soon. Okay, here's what to worry about. I've already said this. Number one, your model's correct. Number two, you've actually done random sampling. Homogeneity of variances is a little bit of a problem. This problem is almost always taken care of if you have more replicates. Most people, and I, I do this myself, I take nearly three replicates all the time when I sample. And when you take just three measurements, you know, again, let's play darts. If I throw three darts at this board, the likelihood that two will be close together and one far away is very high. And that's the problem with just three, three samples. So imagine one time, you know, one cell or one set of measurements, I got two darts over here and one over there. The variance is huge. Imagine the next time all three darts are right around here. The variance is tiny. That's what we mean when we say homogeneity of variance. That can really screw up your statistics tests because you're never going to be able to tell if those two samples are different because once, you know, the ballpark is the size of Yankee Stadium and the other one, the ballpark is the size of a box. <laughs> The box is always going to get lost in Yankee Stadium, right? That's just logic. That's not math. So th that's why taking lots of replicates is always important because you eliminate most of the, you almost always eliminate this problem. And again, a lot of, well, I can go on for hours about that one too. Next one. Uh, Hold view about normality. If you specify the model correctly, and you take lots of samples, don't worry about it. <laughs> and here's that little statistic I was telling you before. Then, what about transformations? I'll admit I'm still a fan of transformations. Um, mostly, to stave off reviewer comments, not because I really think it makes a difference. I've almost never in my entire career run an analysis with transformed data, without transformed data, and gotten different answers. That almost never happens. Sometimes um, interactions will disappear when you transform data, and that's always helpful. But the bottom line is 
Um, if you don't like the shape of your curve, you can always transform the data to make it look more like a bell. And if that makes you feel better, if that makes your reviewers feel better, then just do it. Don't fight them. Half of least resistance is what I do all the time. So one of the things you should bear, be aware of is there's a thing called a transformation severity sequence. So here is, uh, and all of these are essentially y to the x, right? All transformations are y to the x. So this is y to the one, meaning no transformation. So imagine, imagine values like you know, 10, 100, but this is a big range. So here's y to the minus two. Look how we've taken this range and we've actually dropped it two orders of magnitude, which is the square root. That's not severe enough. Why the E, which is, I left out a lot of digits. I think E has got 18 digits. I only kept the first three, 7.18. Look at how nice that is. Everything's a single digit now. You want a more severe transformation with a slightly almost the same thing as y to the fourth, y to the minus four. Again, it brings everything down into its one order of magnitude. Log 10, super severe. We've gone from one to 10,000, zero to 10,000, zero to four. And what is the most severe transformation of all? Presence and absence. And this is why I hate non-parametric statistics. Because to do non-parametric statistics, you essentially have to use the most severe transformation imaginable. You take all the range out of the data, and then you run some silly kind of ranking test. It's absurd. Plus, you can only use non-parametric statistics for a few simple cases. You can use it for t-tests, you can use it for regression, meaning whether or not there's a slope, which is a correlation coefficient. You can use it for one-way and over, two-way and over, and that's it. You can't use it for any other case. You can't use it in multivariate analysis. You would have to run a non-parametric text for every single variable independently. Is that the correct model? Hell no! Those things you measure together are correlated. They're autocorrelated, perhaps. So you're starting out with the wrong model to begin with. And in nearly all environmental studies, they're more complicated than simple one-way and two-way ANOVAs. So between that and this, I don't understand why anyone still uses non-parametric statistic. And I haven't understood it since about 1981 or two, <laughs> when I took a class of not a graduate level course, non-parametric statistics. I took that course because in those days, everyone was really into, oh, your data is not normal. You've got to use non-parametric statistics. When I took the class, I realized this stuff was a waste of time. I mean, it's cute math, but why would you do this? <laughs> Don't understand it at all. But if you all get stuck, here's what you could test. So all you got to do is transform your data all these different kinds of ways, run it through the same model, grab the residuals, plot the residuals, and whichever one gives you the prettiest bell-shaped curve. If that'll make your major professor or your reviewers or people who really don't understand so takes a happy, which most people are, fine. I have long ago accepted the path of least resistance. I don't know, fight with people over these things. But there's the tool if you need it, folks. Ah, now I'm going to give you a sermon. <laughs> Never use the word statistic significant for the rest of your lives. What? But I just took my stat course and they kept telling me about 0.05 means it's 
statistically significant? No, it's not. R.A. Fisher pulled that number out of his hat back in the 1930s. He just said in a very arbitrary way, if something occurs only one in 20 times, it's probably not likely. At the end of the day, when you pick a value like 0 0.05, you've essentially made an arbitrary decision. It's an arbitrary decision. This is why we've stopped using this word significant. It's of absolutely no value. It doesn't prove or disprove anything. And all you really do is you deprive the reader of information, okay? For example, that's significant, but this is not. Does it make any sense? What if it's 0 0.06? What if it's 0 0.07? What if it's 0 0.03, but you know in your heart, I can't believe those two are different. <laughs> Just explain it. Here's a good example of trying to convert these words, these numbers to words. Okay? So, the bigger problem is, and um, I just recommended you do this, and it's wrong, right? Remember I said, try all your transformations, and the one that gives you the prettiest bell shape, use that. That's the classic example of p-hacking, which is definitely against the rules. p-hacking is where you do a whole bunch of tests, and you choose the result you like because it gave you the lowest significant value. It's nonsense. The other reason it's nonsense is it's a sample. What did I say about the mean y bar in the very first slide? What's the difference between a sample mean and a population mean? You're going to get a different sample mean in every sample, in every experiment. What makes you think any one is better than another? The same thing is true with P. If you re-ran time or rerun experiments, I can guarantee you every time you rerun an experiment, you'll get a different p-value, which is, which is why it's not significant. <laughs> It's just one possible outcome of the many different times you could run a test. Why would you put so much faith in it? There's no reason to do that. Bottom line is that word significant is often misunderstood, misinterpreted, misused. So what should you do? I'm getting tired. Well, I don't know if I can talk. It's really two o'clock. Holy shit. I thought this was a one-hour lecture. <laughs> I got to stop talking real soon. So here's what you do. And I'm the editor of this journal, Estuaries and Coasts. And several years ago, I commissioned my buddy, Eric Smith, who's a stat professor at the University of Virginia. And he is a specialist in environmental statistics. So Eric, can you please write me an article to help me set a policy in our journal on why you should never use the word significant and what you should do and said, he said, sure. So here's what he said in his article, and you can go look it up. And Roger can give you all these slides, by the way. Okay, don't worry about it. Basically, um, you can do a bunch of things. Sure, report the p-value, but the important thing is, tell us the actual effect size. Don't say A was significantly larger than B. Say A was five and B was 10. Therefore, B is 50% larger, or it's 100% larger. Parentheses, P and N, always include N. P values without N are absolutely useless. You can't interpret a P value if you don't know the sample size. And here's, here's some examples. I think he actually had these in his papers. I know he put this in a PowerPoint he gave me. 
So here's, here's some text from papers from my journal that we don't want to see anymore. And here's a better way to write it. So, you know, from May to December, conductivity during high tide decreased and significantly changed. P, less than 0 0.0. That's the worst thing. They didn't even tell us the actual P value. How much less? What confidence should anyone have in a sentence like that? So here's how you're supposed to write it. Conductivity change with tide near combinations. <laughs> this is the test statistic. I don't know what a KW is. That's probably K subscript W. P, the actual value, and the sample size, which he never reports in this paper. Because we don't know the sample size, we have no idea whether we should believe this p-value or not. The bottom line is p-value goes down with n. It's a simple mathematical relationship. You get enough dots up there, a scatter diagram is going to look like it's significant when it's not. One more example, plant height decrease linearly with elevation. Again, p less than 0.5. At least it gave us a statistic. So statistic, tell me the actual slope. So this is probably decreasing 14 centimeters with every meter of measurement, right? If it's a regression, it's Y over X. The change in Y change over X. I want to know that it actually changed 14 centimeters every meter. <laughs> That's what the number tells me. And look, he even gives a confidence interval as well. There could be any number between those, but again, we don't know n. So the so do it that way. Just say it went up, it went down, or it didn't change. And then give the actual test, the actual p-value, the actual n. Okay. This is my last section. I'm going to buzz through this because I'm tired. <laughs> Let me too. Um, we started with our question. We built our design, our experiment. We got our data. We managed it really well. We finally got all our analyses done. Now we're ready for the PAs, PAs and the installs. We're ready for the final beautiful product, right? The final beautiful product is gonna be a table or figure. If you have a map, put latitude and longitude in it. Um, just remember, the default values in software is almost never these numbers. Always start with black and white, because black and white will force you to make it clear. Always make sure you build your graphics in 300 dots per inch. And think about the size, think about the end game, and the format's gonna to matter too, okay? So let me show you a quick example. Um, so years ago, I measured something like phosphate and a bunch of different bays. But notice there are upper bays, lower bays, and four estuary simple systems. So here is the default settings of phosphate versus salinity. It's called a mixing curve. So you notice that number one, in the key on the bottom, the bays are all mixed up. You also notice the symbols are all the same. So the next thing I did is I created a black and white version, and I fixed it so that um, everything was more readable in terms of font size and things like that. You'll notice they had different symbols and with monochrome, everything popped. You'll also notice that for the estuaries, I kept on the same symbols, the upper estuary open, the lower estuary, the lower bay with a closed symbol. So now the symbols told you two things. 
So the point is, I was able to make this a lot more readable and a lot more, and make the key make more sense by just customizing those aspects. And then you can add color to make it pop. Now you can see the, the different colors of the different estuary systems. Okay. So the point is never start with default, never start with color, always start with black and white. And believe me, you'll be able to make a more impressive uh, graphic if you do it in black and white and then add color to pop and think about what the color means. Don't just take the default settings. I think that's my last slide. Oh, and here's an example of how that fit on the page in the journal. And the reason I'm showing this is, you, we're back to, remember the first thing I said was think about the endpoint and work backwards. You've got to think about what's this going to look like on a printed page <laughs> or a PDF and scale everything so it fits on that printed page right. And I designed everything to fit in one column. Okay, so think about that as well. And now, now I'm possible done. <gasps> all right, well, I'm sorry it took so long. I'll be a half of the Are there any quick questions? Uh, technically, we got nine minutes, I guess. I can answer them, I hope. <laughs> Again, I didn't try and teach you everything in the world about statistics today. What I did do is I kind of went through. Whoops, I'm sort of wait if I fall out sit on that. What I did try and do is go through what I call the entire analytics process from questions to design to acquisition to management, analysis and visualization. At the end of the day, just remember your thesis, your project, or whatever has to end like this. So Make sure all those steps get you here. <laughs> but think about what that endpoint is going to be. Yeah. Have a just philosophical question. Sure. So, like, what is you talked about, like your opinions on p values, and you know, not wanting to say, okay, if, if the p value looks like this, then you say one thing or another. But like, if your p values don't suggest anything, right? So non-significance, but for lack of a better word, because I'm not yeah. there yet. What is your opinion on still then trying to talk about the data in, so so say the numbers look like they're trending towards something, but the p-value doesn't suggest that. What 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 is your opinion on how you should discuss that? Just state it exactly like you said it. In fact, I've done that in my career a long, long time ago. I'll never forget, I did this one study I think it was actually another hypoxia study. And um, because the sample size was so small, I got a p value of like 0 0.07. And I said, even though the p, and, and I did this way before I knew any of this kind of stuff, I think I wrote something like, even though the, the p value is above 0 0.07, I believe these are different because, and I probably gave a bunch of reasons. If they were different, they would fit the theory <laughs> that uh, low oxygen was bad for organisms. <laughs> so the important thing was I I got a trend. Remember, I said talk about the trend in the data. So I was expecting a lower number of organisms in the hypoxic zone, and I found a lower number of organisms in the hypoxic zone. Like every single time I looked. But the p value was above 0 0.05. Well, shit, I believe it. I believe it was still lower. I believe I just didn't take enough samples to get a statistically significant p value. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just admitted, you know, I probably should have taken more, more than three replicates. <laughs> the other thing that's really important, never be afraid to report negative results. Mm -hmm. it, it's one of the things that we we too. Too often we worry about, oh gosh, I didn't get what I was expecting. So therefore it's, it's a negative result and it's not publishable. That's not true. What you actually have is data that doesn't support your hypothesis. 
which means the hypothesis needs to be looked re looked at, or the question needs to be re asked. And so, writing a discussion that explains why you might have gotten the result you did, or what kind of studies could be done to do a better test, that would be incredibly valuable. That's how science is iterative. We get better every time we do it. So you want to give help to people in the future who take on those questions and problems. Thank you. Nope. Uh, this is more of an ethical question regarding p hacking. Um, so, uh, in terms of the process which you discussed here, uh, sometimes you don't get to sit down and be with the process throughout a project. Sometimes you get the data uh, that somebody collected in the past, and then you have to analyze it. And um, when it comes to then analyzing that data, um, sometimes I, I, uh, it happens that you, you do one statistical analysis, you don't get something significant, and your advisor is like, okay, do it again, but with this model. And it seems like sometimes to me that you're it's p hacking, you're trying to, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so. Yeah, you just described a perfect example of p-hacking. And the bottom line is, you know, that, that's part of being unethical and being dishonest. You know, you just got to stop yourself. <laughs> it's kind of like walking by the candy jar. You know, you shouldn't dip in and grab another piece of chocolate, but you do it anyway. You know, we, we, you just, just need discipline. You just need to... We're back to why I give you this lecture. That progression and the end point. You know, once you head down the path, don't go wavering around trying to find something to support something that may not be true. Because at the end, you're doing yourself a disservice, right? So just, believe me, I've been there many times myself where I did not get the answer I was looking for. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'll, I'll fool around with it. The perfect example is trying a bunch of different transformations. Let me give you the perfect example. I'm guilty of this. I'll fess up. A lot of times you get a significant interaction. Well, a significant interaction means the higher level test is invalid. So if I want to know if stations are different because these two had hypoxia and these two didn't, and then I wind up with a significant interaction between station and date, that means the, the station test is invalid. How do I deal with that? Oh, look, if I log transform it though, the interaction goes away. That's the most common form of PAC that I'm, that I'm guilty of. I've done it. I'm telling you it's wrong, but I'm telling you I've done it. But also I can justify the transformation based on other things. I do get prettier distributions of residuals. Um, so, so do that, you know, I, I would definitely look at the distributions of residuals and ask myself if I believe, what result I believe. Compare your results to the theory of the question or whatever, ask yourself, what do you really believe? And if you really believe it, you know, don't beat yourself up too much. I'm just trying to be practical now. <laughs> I mean, we all do it. We all we all have probably done a little bit too much p hacking in our lives. Uh, when I say we, I mean old people, <laughs> people who've analyzed. I can't tell you how many data sets I've analyzed at this point in my life. Probably thousands and thousands. I've got over eighty thousand files on my computer, so I must have done this many, many times. And uh, you know, just just do the best you can is the answer. <laughs> But keep, keep in mind that you don't want to keep trying different tests, different models until you get the result you, 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 you want. At some point, you're crossing a line from doing something reasonable to doing something unreasonable. And that's that's here, that's inside you. You got to figure that one out on your own. <laughs> I think the best advice I've been given on that uh, or things to consider are, you have to be able to explain your model. So whatever your result is, can you explain it? And can you justify it? So right. if you can explain what's going on and you can justify why you made these choices, right. then you can proceed. Because okay. I've worked with data sets that were given to me in classes 
and run analyses. And I'm like, I cannot explain this result. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, with my own data, I think, because Paul was on my committee, um, he's like, PCAs never have a third component. And I was like, mine does, I swear. I can explain <laughs> this, like from what those variables are, I thought with that component, like it makes sense. He's like, you can explain it. <laughs> So, it's so, you know, <laughs> if you guys need help diagramming your experiments or trying to figure out what the right statistical tests to use, or if you need any questions about anything I've said, feel free to, you know, email me, call me on the phone, walk in my office. My office is around the corner. I always, always want to help anybody with anything. It's no worries. And you can share my presentation. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.